Ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Risotto. What is happening, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 116. 116. I don't know. I don't even understand how we got to 116, but it's definitely a great number. And we're almost to 120. We're almost 150. And we're almost to 200. So I guess that's something to look forward to down the line. Uh, and today we are joined by a very special guest. Uh, this guy uh, is a former first round pick who played in parts of eight professional seasons. He appeared in 21 games with the San Diego Padres in 2008. Now he coaches baseball uh, and uh, has a YouTube channel with over 200,000 subscribers. It is Matt Antonelli from Antonelli Baseball. And Matt, thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Welcome. I'm doing great, and I appreciate you having me. So, I mean, I, I know that it's been a packed summer. I'm glad we get to set this up because it's it's been a little bit of a back and forth because you've had a packed summer with coaching and everything that's going on. Um, so, so walk me through kind of your usual schedule during the summer, the teams you coach, et cetera, et cetera. Because, I, I mean, I don't know if there's anybody busier in the world during the summertime than, than Matt Antonelli over there on the East Coast. I agree with you. I, uh, yeah, so I'll give you kind of the, the heavy part of our schedule. It really starts in the spring, April 1st. So I coach high school baseball as well as Antonelli baseball. So we've got 13 teams in our, in our travel program. I've also got the high school season starting in April. And from April 1st until probably September 1st, I don't know if I take a day off. A lot of people don't believe me when I say I'm at baseball every day for those from April till uh, September 1st, uh, but I really am pretty much on the field every single day. So we've got, we've got games going on throughout the entire spring. Most of it's local, which makes it a little easier. Uh, once we get into the summer, that's when I start to coach our 17 new team, which is basically our recruiting team. And we do a lot of traveling. So I'm kind of all over the country. I was in, I don't know how many different States throughout, uh, the summer, um, had the bright idea of driving down to a couple of them, one down to Georgia, tried to make a, a semi family vacation out of it. And so, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time in my car, a lot of time on the field but I could be doing a lot worse things than coaching baseball. So it's always, it's always nice when you get to do what you love. Hey, there you go. So is this time right now, you, you mentioned September 1st, is this time right now your kind of resting period? Do you hop in the fall ball at any point or is it just, you know, we're going to get back at it in the, in the springtime? What's, what's this time like? Yeah. So we do have fall ball going on right now. Uh, what I try to do, my I would call my slower season basically September, October, November. Um, and then once we get to December, we're back. I'm in the facility basically seven days a week starting in December because we've got winter training going on then. Uh, right now, I, I try to slow down with my lessons. Uh, lesson schedule can be crazy throughout the year. So, um, you know, my son's playing. Uh, he's playing fall ball right now. He's playing basketball and football and all this stuff. So I try to take. I need some time of the year to be able to get to family events. That's the one tough part about the summer and the spring is that I miss a lot of stuff because I'm on the road so much. And so I try to make the next couple months a little bit more geared towards my family, making sure that I can get to as much stuff as possible. But um, baseball really has turned into a year round thing, even in Massachusetts where we don't have really nice weather. Uh, we still have baseball going on throughout the year, uh, whether it's, you know, outdoor fall ball or whether it's one on one training or small group training. There's just so many things that that uh, that happen. And so many kids are playing the sport in this area year round, just like you know, typically you see that more down south or maybe out in California. But uh, it's really started to happen in the north because of the facilities that are available. You can really get work done throughout the year. And, you know you know, this kids nowadays, they have access to a lot of different things on the internet. So they could easily go check out your stats or check out, you know, what you did during your career. Uh, obviously I'm sure when you, when you meet them, or I'm sure you might've been with some of these kids for a while, but so it's been mentioned, but maybe when you introduce yourself, but do they know the exact extent of your career and maybe someone in your shoes having the success that you had that is now coaching them? Do they understand like, that you were a big league player, first round pick and all this fun stuff? 
Yeah, I think most of the players in our organization understand the level I played at, but it's interesting. Everyone interprets it differently. So you'll have some people that will say, wow, I really want you to coach my son. You played in the major league. You must know everything. And I always tell those people, don't play for our organization or for me because you think that I played in the major leagues and I have all the answers because there's plenty of great coaches that didn't play in the major leagues, didn't play professionally. Um, but then you also have another, there's the, the opposite end of that spectrum where certain players will say, man, you were terrible in the major leagues. You only played for, you know, I think I have like a year of service time. I hit under 200 and they're like, you're terrible. Why would I ever want to learn from you? So, um, you know, you get both ends of the spectrum and I don't think either one is really right. I, I don't think you have to be a major league all-star hall of famer to be a great coach. Um, are there, are there people that were great at the sport that played at a high level that are great coaches? Yes, but you don't need that to be a great coach. So, um, I, you know, I, I don't, talk much about my uh, experience as a, as a player. I don't try to tell people that I played at a high level, therefore you have to listen to me, but I do try to take what I learned at those levels and try to pass that on without um, saying, do this just because I happen to do it or um, because I saw, you know, Alex Rodriguez or Adrian Gonzalez or someone like that do it. So I, I guess, again, you see it from, from both sides of the uh, spectrum. Yeah, there you go. And I, you mentioned that you're very familiar with the travel ball scene, traveling the country, and you know there's a whole narrative around it. And there's there's a stigma, and it it's that travel balls are rip off, and it's not worth the money, and it's a toxic industry. And uh, you know, travel and, and summer baseball probably isn't for everybody. But is there any truth to any of those criticisms around it? I, I guess from someone like you who's been involved in it for a few years now. Yeah, so I think that um, I really think it's it's organization specific, and I think I always start with this. Sorry, my phone's going off. I always start with this. Um, I played travel baseball when I was younger. It was different then than it is now. There's I don't know how many more teams now, but there's a lot more teams. When I played, there was probably only seven or eight in our whole state. Now there's like seven hundred in our state, um, and so that it has changed, um, but. What I owe a ton uh, to travel baseball. Uh, I learned a ton of baseball from my experience there. I think it's one of the best things that I did. Um, my father coached me when I was younger. He always said that he thought the biggest things for me were to play with and against the best players I could possibly play with. And so um, I played travel baseball because I played with a lot of really good players that pushed me in practice, and I played against a lot of good players that pushed me in games and I think that's really important and I had very good coaches so if you can find a program that offers that then I think it's really worth it um, I've seen plenty of programs that don't offer that and that's where people get upset at and, and they say you know travel baseball is not worth it um, I think that with our program my goal is to, to help players put players in those 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 two areas where we talked about where we want to have as skilled of a team as possible. So they're playing against the best players possible. Uh, we want to go to places where they're playing against the best players possible. And I'm trying to put a coaching staff together that will help our players improve every single day. And so we've had success growing our program because of those three areas. Uh, I'm always trying to improve in those three areas. So I'm trying to get us to have better players. And again, that's through instruction mostly through through instruction we're just opening up our own facility for the first time ever we've always kind of rented out other people's facilities now we're going to actually have our own facility um and so my goal is to get our players as good as possible like i want them to be uh if you play for us most of our players 99 percent of them want to play in college a lot of them want to try to play beyond college we've had uh, five players drafted in my eight years or so we've been around a lot of players want to go that route. It's very difficult, but I want to provide the players everything I can to get them to where they want to go, whether that's to be a great high school player, a great college player, a great pro player. Um, that's my, that's what I want to do. That's why I have the organization. Um, I don't have it because I didn't start this because I thought, Oh, what a good business to get into. Um, I said, I love coaching and that's, and this is a way for me to be able to coach players. I think the programs that are in it for those reasons are good. 
there's a lot of programs that got into it. People got into it because they said, oh, wow, look at all these travel ball programs. And either one, you know, let me start a program and I can have my son play and make sure he's a starting shortstop. Or people said, um, oh, it's a great, look at it. It must be a good business. All these programs are, are, are bouncing up all over the place. Uh, and I tell people when it comes to business, if you want to get into it to make money and have a business, there's like a, I can name a thousand things you'd rather do than a travel baseball program. It's not the most lucrative business in the world. If you don't enjoy coaching and enjoy helping kids, then stay away from it. Go do a different business. There you go. Go to a different business. You heard it here first. Antonelli baseball just built different. Um, so what is the age? Cause my brother and I coach, uh, uh, a non-competitive league here in the Bay area uh, we coach a team and it's very non-competitive pitching machine. You know, they don't keep track of score. Um, and I believe it's like seven, eight, nine year olds. And it's a lot sometimes, you know, and, and I, I played four years in high school. So I always feel like, okay, pickoffs, but like, Oh, we're not there yet. You know, uh, leads mm -hmm. off first base. We're not there yet. So what is the age where you could finally start like teaching the more advanced stuff to some of these kids? Yeah, so I think it depends on the league and where you are. Like for our area, 11-year-olds uh, and up start leading. So that becomes kind of real baseball. 10-year-olds uh, and, and younger, uh, you can't lead. So um, our, our program, we are 11U and up. Um, we've had a lot of people that want us to start at a younger age. We've thought about it. I train a lot of players at younger ages, but we just don't have teams for younger ages. Um, I know that there's programs around the country that do. Uh, so f for me, I think if you're, if you're coaching 11U and up, which is what I do in a team atmosphere, it does probably make it a little bit easier because the game is kind of the game, right? Like uh, you might do things slightly different because of the smaller diamond, but essentially we're teaching very similar mechanics when it comes to taking leads and stealing and, and cutoffs and relays and, and holding runners and, and all that stuff, which I really like. Um, if you're coaching at a younger level than that, then the game probably revolves a little bit more around the fundamentals, which it does really at any level, but maybe at a younger level, it's really more about the fundamentals, whether that's catching, throwing, hitting, running, um, whatever that is, or it can also, again, be about the mental part of the game, approach at the plate, um, approach in the field, uh, those type of things. So I really just think it depends on the age level, but Ultimately, we're trying to teach very similar stuff, no matter no matter the age, and um, we might get a little bit more descriptive or a little bit more, um, you know, with the with the younger kids, we might have to break it down just a tiny bit more than we do with the older kids. We can get a little bit more advanced with the older kids, but ultimately, I think, you know, I'm I'm teaching our if I have an, a nine, a ten, an eleven year old that comes in for let's just say a hitting lesson, or I'm working with them. Uh, I'm trying to teach them very similarly to how I'm teaching an older player as far as I'm teaching them a swing that I think will play and work as they get older. Um, I know a lot of times when I see a younger levels, it's like, okay, let's teach them this because it works as a nine-year-old. But if it doesn't work as a 12-year-old, then for me, I'd rather start to build in the good mechanics and fundamentals at the nine-year-old level that will help them transition to a higher level. Cause for most of them, they want to play, you know, they want to be successful when they're nine, but also when they're 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on. So I guess that's kind of the way I look at development. And, and the one thing about baseball now is that, you know, you turn on the TV and not just baseball pro sports in general, you turn on the TV and you see athletes being very nonchalant and serious. Um, and, you know, they're getting paid to do it. So there's maybe some added pressure there. Uh, yes, you want these, these kids to take their work seriously and improve and see them improve. But do you ever have to remind them like, you know, loosen up a little bit, you know, have fun. This is a game that probably you're not going to play forever. Um, so is, is there ever that reminder to like, let them know to have fun? Cause sometimes it gets lost in the fold. Yeah, 100%. I think if you don't have fun, if the player's not having fun, they're not going to improve and they're probably going to quit. I think the, the number one rule as a coach is don't be the coach that made a player quit the game and try a different sport. Like that should be your number one goal and number one rule. Um, and if you do that, then you probably need to look at maybe coaching a different sport or doing something else. So um, I think that is a huge, huge part of it. 
I do think that, um, again, through my experience looking over the last, let's just say, 25 years, taking me back to when I was 12 years old, how much the landscape has changed around not just baseball, but every sport. I think players and parents, I think there's a lot more pressure on both of them now um, for a host of reasons. And I think sometimes that takes the fun out of the game. I think back to when I was 10, 11, 12, uh, whatever I did on the field, uh, no one else was ever going to really know about that. Like it wasn't going on, it wasn't going to go on social media. I wasn't going to get ranked by any of these ranking services. Uh, I was just playing because I, I loved baseball. I wanted to have fun and I was trying to win the game. Like I was, I, I grew up in a town called Peabody. I was trying to win the Peabody West championship with me and my buddies. Like that's what we were doing. So, um, that's all I cared about. But it's different now because now players, I mean, I have players that are 12 and 13 that talk to me about college recruiting. And I'm just like, why are we thinking about college recruiting at 12 and 13? Like, can we just have fun playing the game? So I totally agree with you. I think, um, I think a lot of good things have happened in the game of baseball, but I also think there's been a lot of not so good things, especially when it comes to youth baseball. And that's probably one of them. Like, losing touch of uh, just trying to have fun and, and like you said play play it it is a game it's supposed to be fun when you're a professional player and you're getting paid that's completely different than when you're a young kid playing the game and just supposed to be outside enjoying it um and again i think about like just playing pick up baseball out in the yard like my mentality playing sandlot ball with my buddies was the same as when i played uh, little league ball or Babe Ruth or travel ball. Like all of it was just because we loved to do it and we wanted to play. We wanted to get better. Like, of course I wanted to improve and I wanted to, you know, make my high school team and all that stuff. But I just think that there's a lot more pressure. People focus sometimes on the wrong thing. You know, I hear so much about getting kids ranked at such young ages. And I'm like, who cares about rankings? Like nobody cares about what your ranking is on some site when you're 12 years old. It, it's to me, it's ridiculous, but um, some people do take that really serious. And I think that does probably drain some of the fun out of it for players because they can be kids and enjoy themselves. So um, yeah, I don't want to go too much on a rant there, but yeah, there's definitely things that I think need to, I don't know if they'll ever change, but unfortunately the landscape has changed over the years and, that, and that's where we are. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I was on Twitter the other day and I saw this one, um, eighth grade. He's an eighth grader in, in Northern California in the Bay Area quarterback, eighth grade quarterback. So he has never played high school football. And he had a graphic of all these like offers from high schools, private high schools. And then one of them was like from a from like a college. And I'm like, this kid's eighth in eighth grade. And you're you're a college and you're thinking to yourself, this kid's our quarterback in 10 years. Like, how can you project that far into the future? It's amazing that, like, it's almost like brainwash. It's amazing that an eighth grade who's, I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to get too much on a rant either because it's so complex. Well, and the tough part is, is that when people start to see that players and parents see that, and now they say, well, you know, what I've noticed is people will call me or talk to me at the field and say, you know, can you get our 11 year old or 12 year old up on your social media more we, for more exposure? Right. And I'm like, it's, again, we go at exposure. Like why we, what do we need exposure for? But I think people see that eighth grader getting recruited to these places and, and parents and kids say, well, Ooh, he's getting recruited, you know, to a college at 13 years old. I want to do that too. And so it's just a tough cycle. Um, I think eventually, I don't know when I hope that, and again, I don't know other sports. I really just know baseball, but I think there needs to be some rules put in place where players, we can give players the opportunity to not worry about college recruiting at such a young age. Um, I didn't think about college recruiting until they, almost at the end of my junior year. I didn't commit to Wake Forest until my senior fall. Back in those days, schools couldn't talk to you until the summer leading into your senior season. And so I never even thought about colleges, which was amazing for me. I, I look at it now and it's like, we have to talk to players going into high school about getting ready for college in the recruiting process. And I'm like, they haven't even been to high school yet. Like they don't need, like 
it's just it's the the process has been pushed too far forward and unfortunately like i do have to i do have to help players get recruited earlier now because that's that's when the process is i just think there needs to be some type of rules or something put in place where we can push the, the process back again so kids can be where they actually are and enjoy it high school when they're in high school and instead of being in high school and only worried about college um i just don't think that's very fun for kids right they can't enjoy themselves where they are so i always talk about be where your feet are like whatever you're doing at that present time like focus on that but it's hard when people are trying you know when kids have to focus on college their freshman year of high school like that's just crazy but that's the way it is unfortunately yeah, skipping the prom for for like a lift or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, hopefully it does change. I think you're right. Um, and, and you did a video a few weeks back, kind of shifting gears here. You did a video a few weeks back titled, um, and if you haven't watched it, go watch it. Should you walk or jog back to the dugout after a strikeout? And I was like, okay, yeah. here we go. Another Antonelli themed video that only he would think of. Um, so I mean, me just thinking about it now, the answer has to be walk, right? Like, I mean, obviously yeah. go watch the video, but the answer has to be walk. Nobody's jogging back to the dugout after a strikeout. Well, the reason I asked that, I, well, the reason that video came up is because we have one player on our team that, that like runs back to the dugout and everyone <laughs> kind of gets on him, like stop running. And he, and he, he runs everywhere. So like, I just, he, he doesn't know how to not run. Right. Um, but it was an interesting topic. It's one of those weird things where um, just being around the game a lot, you know, I've always, I, I mean, I've struck out a ton of times and I've always walked back to the dugout. It's always, I think at a higher level, if you run back to the dugout, you actually probably get yelled at and people say, don't run back to the dugout. I'm like, you shouldn't look that happy. It's almost one of those like weird unwritten rule things where, you know, all these things happen uh, that are unwritten, um, but just, for whatever reason, that's the way they've been done. And they kind of continue to go that way. And baseball is actually changing a little bit now, a lot of the older unwritten rules, but the walking back to the dugout or running back, it's like, usually what I see at a, at a real young level, like some coaches will say, Hey, run back to the dugout. Right. Um, and then usually when you get a little bit older, it, it kind of flips and it becomes, don't run back to the dugout anymore. Like walk back to the dugout, you know, don't smash your helmet and throw a bat and all that <laughs> stuff. But, um, just just walk back so again I, I made the video i don't even have an answer why it's done that way that's just one of those weird things again where it seems to be done that way at most levels of baseball yeah it's kind of like that you know where where you hit you know ball down the right field line and you're you know a third of the way to first and they tell you to walk back to the plate and you know there apparent i always heard was was told that it's something with your eyesight getting your eyes readjusted or something like that mm -hmm. i was like ah that's probably hogwash or maybe it's not, I don't know. And then another one is when you, I've seen kids foul the ball off behind the plate I was, and then I was run to a hard 90 to first base. And it's like, where are you going? The ball's behind you. You know that it's behind you. You know, where, where are you going? So that's, that's I, I was one. just going to say that right when you were finished, I was going to say, well, how about the foul ball straight back? So like, I, I see that a lot when we get kids at our youngest level, they'll foul a ball that they know is straight back but they sprint because they've always been told, you know, run, run, run. I think some of that is just, you know, obviously, well, one, you've probably been coached to do it at a young level, but I, I, and I understand it for a little kid, you know, when they're probably six or seven and they're just playing and they hit a ball and half the time they don't know where it is. It's the coaches always just said, Hey, just run the first, no matter what. But I do think there comes a time when you play the game enough, but you know, probably nine or 10 years old is probably enough for most players where, you know that if the ball, whether the ball is somewhat close to fair territory or if there's 0% chance that this ball is, is landing in fair territory, and those ones you can have some more feel to not um, sprint down the line, you know, give it a hard 90 or at that, at that level, uh, a hard 60. And then ha we have to sit there and wait for you to walk all the way back when we all knew that the ball was fouled off immediately and so did you. So. <laughs> and then you turn on the TV and you watch like a big league game and a guy falls, fouls the ball straight off and he's like, damn it, you know, because he thought he should have yeah. had it. So it's like there's the, the contrast is just so different. So it's hilarious. 100%. Um, how, how and this is a very vague but i'm gonna ask it anyways how do you teach hitting because I, I know um if if you see a guy in an ultimate slump you know swing is all messed up 
your your task with rebuilding is swing. Do you stick with the modern age? You know, swing up. Let's get some elevation. Let's let's hit some doubles in the gap. Let's you know, let's hit one four hundred and fifteen feet away. Get our OPS up. Get our slugging up. Or are you still with the traditional kind of mindset of swing down on the ball? Let's hit line drives. Let's spray the ball all over the field. I guess that's a yep. very like. I mean, that we could do a whole separate podcast yeah. on that. But just your short answer on, on kind of your your way of teaching hitting with the evolution of it. Sure. Um, so when I look at a player, I think I start with a couple of things. The first thing I start off with real quick is usually it's three things. So one, if a player's struggling, one, we look at their timing. Are they in position to hit on time? Like when the swing has to be swung, when you have to swing, are you in a position to get your best swing off, your A swing off? Uh, if you're not, then you have to make an adjustment. Maybe it's start a little bit earlier. Maybe it's start later. So look at timing first. Then I look at pitch selection. Like, what are you swinging at? You can have the greatest swing in the world, but if you're swinging at everything, you have, if you have no plan or approach at the plate, well, it doesn't matter how good your swing is, right? So that, so maybe it's, it's, we just have to look at your pitch selection and we have to make adjustments there. If timing looks good and pitch selection looks good, then you go to swing mechanics. And then when you get to swing mechanics, this is, as you said, there's, there's lots of different viewpoints on the swing. I think each player is different. I think you have to look at the player um, and see what is it, right? What is it that they, what is happening, right? So ball flight will tell you a lot of, about that. So I'll look at, you know, and, and sometimes you can't get this information all the time, but we, I, I track ball flight a ton when I coach. So every time a hitter hits, I put, I write down um, the quality of contact. So one, two, or three, one's a poor hit ball, two's an average hit ball, three's a hard hit ball. And then you get a, um, which, what was it? Was it a, a, a line drive? Was it a pop fly? Was it a fly ball? Was it a ground ball? So I put G for ground ball, L for line drive, F for fly ball, P for pop up. And then I put where it was hit, L, C, or R, left field, center field, or right field. So if you track that for your team, you start to get an idea of where the ball is being hit. You have a player that's consistently rolling over ground balls to the left side as a righty. Um, that can tell you something about their swing, right? So you, um, or are they constantly popping out to the right side with, you know, with shallow fly balls. So um, I take that data if I have it, if it's one of my players, I have it. If I, if it's not, I don't. Um, and then I get into their swing. Now I've watched like thousands and thousands and thousands. I mean, I lots and lots of hitters hit. So I have a pretty good idea of, I can watch a hitter pretty quickly uh, identify what's going on in the swing. I look at, I look at bat path first off, like what's the bat doing through the hitting zone. That tells you a lot that you need to know. Um, and usually I can look at a bat path and tell the hitter immediately, you must hit a lot of these balls and those balls. And they're like, yeah, you're right. I do do that a lot. And so like different swings um, produce certain results more often than not. And so um, I, I guess I start with the, the bat path and, and listen, when you look at the numbers, the numbers say, and you can look at any successful player at a high level, that the bat is going to be, and, and, and we know this through whether it's, um, you know, bat sensors or uh, uh, the major leagues has their own system that they're using, but we can get the numbers that the bat is going to be slightly up through the hitting zone, right? So, like, we know that. The question is, um, well, one, some people take it to an extreme, so some people think, you know, you've got to swing up. So they're swinging up like 45 degrees up. And then you have other people that um, are still kind of more in the old school, like you've got to be down to and through the ball. And so I think the numbers, we have numbers now that we didn't have back then kind of tell you what the swing is supposed to be. Um, so it's making sure that we're not, I guess, it's exaggerating one way or the other, right? Like, so when I talk about swinging slightly up, um, I, I want our players to be slightly up through the hitting zone and we want to hit line drives like with carry. Um, again, some people get caught up and say, no, no, we're going to just hit high. You know, we're trying to get everything in the air and you see those exaggerated people, just like you see people say, no, we're going to smash everything into the ground. I don't think either one of those are right. So um, I think to keep it simple, it's I'm looking to hit a hard line drive with some carries in the middle of the field. And if you do that, you're in a pretty good spot. And then how do we get the player to do that? That's where I think the experience comes in of working with a lot of players and being able to make small tweaks to 
you know, how they're getting loaded and the position that they're in when they're hitting and, and how their weight's distributed. And like, there's a lot, like, this is where you said we could talk for hours about this. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, but I think if you want to keep it as simple as possible, it's uh, get into a really strong hitting position on time. Think about driving line drive through the middle of the field. That's like the simplest possible thing I could tell a hitter. And then obviously we're going to work towards, okay, now how do we do that? Um, which would be like a five hour discussion probably on there. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. And if I had like a, a quarter, every time I heard the term, you know, hit the ball on the ground with your speed, you should be hitting the ball on the ground. Right. It's like, Oh, okay. That's interesting. But um, yeah, that's again, an hour long discussion for another day. Um, what do you, what do you think about the, the defensive shift ban? Well, I guess I should start this, start with this. The defensive shifts in baseball, uh, they're going to be limited next year in 2023. Um, certain limitations are going to be put on them. You have to have both feet in the dirt. Um, the shortstop can't come over to the second base side. Um, yada, 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 two guys on each side, all of that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a part of you, you know, I, I know you played a lot of second base, second baseman in the big leagues. Is there a part of you that's excited to see more rangy second basemen again? Because I feel like we've been stuck in this like weird place with Max Muncy playing second base and the Reds tried Mike Moustakis at second base. And it seemed like for a while, you don't need a lot of skill to play the position anymore. So it's like, you're going to need defense there. You're going to need defense at shortstop again. Um, and, and maybe we get to see some more guys dive. So is that like an upside to yeah. this? Do you like the shifts? Just overall thoughts on that. Yeah, well, well, I think you definitely are going to need more range. You're not going to be able to hide players as much because, you know, if you're only allowed two guys on one, on one side of the base, they've got to cover more area. So um, I, I do think it probably brings back, uh, if you have a deficiency as far as defensively range-wise, you can't cover it up as much by having another defender kind of come over onto their side of the base and help them out. So I, I definitely do think that that will, will happen. Um, Listen, I do think I, I, I didn't have, I'm kind of weird. I, I've said this in some of my videos where I don't fight a lot about the rules. I just say, you know, no matter what level I'm at, I'm like, tell me the rules and I'm going to play by them. And I'm going to figure out, okay, how can we use our personnel and how can we play within the rules as, as much as possible while taking advantage of whatever the rule is. So like, I've never been one to fight about that stuff. There's some people that have been so against the shift ever since, you know, people started implementing it. And there's people that are really upset now that the game is going away from the shift. And like, for me, I don't have super hard feelings or strong feelings either way. Um, but I do, I do think without the shift now i do think uh like you said defender is gonna be a little different for defenders i do think that there's going to be there should be more more hits i do think a few players now are not going to feel like they have to hit the ball out of the park and over the shift you know if i'm a lefty that pulls the ball a lot and they're playing not only three defenders on the right side of the base, but they've got the second baseman almost in right field to where I feel like I can't hit any, I can't get anything through the infield. Even if I hit a line drive, there's so many times where, I mean, I was just at a game last week. There was a rocket hit, which right off the bat, that's a hit, but there's a second baseman standing halfway in the outfield and it's just a line drive right to him. Like when I played, uh, no one really, we didn't really do that really ever. So like that's a hit every time. I can feel the frustration of a hitter knowing like, man, I can't hit anything over here. Now people will say, well, just learn to hit the ball the other way. But the, the issue is pitching is better than it's ever been before. And it's not that easy. I know it seems easy to just say, Hey, I'm just going to like, you know, I'm going to get any pitch and Oh, there's no defender over there. So I'm just going to hit a line drive over there. It is so hard to do that at any point in the game, but never mind today when the average fastball velocity is higher than it's ever been. Breaking stuff is better than it's, than it's ever been before. Um, and pitchers, and pitchers have a really good understanding of what you do well and what you don't do well. And they can, they can attack it really, really well. So pitching is like, I think everyone knows pitching has been pretty far ahead of hitting for a while. I think hitting is starting to try to make a comeback. Um, 
but it's just, it's difficult. It's difficult to hit and it's hard to hit with the shift. So I think it will put more balls in play. It'll, it'll, it'll incentivize hitters, make them feel more comfortable just putting a ball in play and not trying to hit a ball over the shift every single time. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, I, I think it's, it'll be good. I think, um, I think the game has gotten a little bit too far to like the three outcomes. It's like, walk home run or strikeout and i think you do want to incentivize putting the ball in play a little bit more i don't think the game's ever going to go back to like lots of hit and runs or just giving out giving up outs by just you know trying to inside out a ball and just move runners over i still think power plays on the mound power plays at the plate but it doesn't just have to be home run or bust Um, i think it can still be doubles it can be you know maybe accidental ground ball singles uh, that can actually squeak through and we can get more base runners. I think that's more exciting for fans and for obviously for players to, to get on with that as well. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm excited to see how it goes. Yeah. And somebody asked Posey Buster Posey after a game um, last year about the shift and they're like, Oh, you know, why don't players just hit the ball the other way? And, and they were facing Walker Bueller that night and Buster Posey said something like, yeah, against Bueller slider, you know, it's easier said than done. It's hey, I can't talk said than done. So, um, yeah. you know, it definitely, uh, I'm interested to see it too. I want to see if, you know, I, I don't know how many people in baseball still have stock and batting average as a stat that, to use. I don't think front offices do, but, you know, guys are going to have a few ticks higher on their batting average. So it should be uh, interesting to watch. Let's jump into your career here real quick. Um, you know, first round pick by the Padres at a Wake Forest back in 2006. I mean, I, I was looking at that draft last night. It's just completely loaded. Lincecum mm-hmm. and Scherzer and Kershaw and Longoria and uh, Pacifica, my hometown, Pacifica's own Greg Reynolds, uh, <laughs> who's a name that yep. seems like a Rizzo cast name that I should get on. Uh you know, and you've had to live with the headlines a little bit. You know, Matt Antonelli, bust, horrible mm-hmm. pick. You probably hear that, uh, maybe not as much now, but uh, never panned out. Does that still sting years later, uh, you know, reading that stuff? Or have you kind of learned to deal with it a little bit? Uh, yeah, honestly, I uh, that stuff never really bothered me at all. Um, listen, I wish that I had played 15 years in the major leagues. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, when I got drafted, um, well, let's say this, if I go back, when I play when I was younger, if you had told me, like I told everyone I want to play in the major leagues, if you told me I was going to play in the major leagues one day, like that seems crazy to me to even think about that. So like, you know, that in itself is, uh, you know, a dream come true, as they say, right? So like, I never expected that. Um, When I got... I remember when I got my, my first offer to play college baseball, like I was in my mind, I was surprised that that happened. Uh, I remember I went and watched a college game, Virginia versus Florida state. Uh, Cause Virginia had some interest in me and I left the field and told my dad, I said, I can never play at this level. This level is way too high for me. But if Virginia, for some reason wants to offer me, I'm going to Virginia because I just want like this is amazing. So that was my mentality as a high school player. And then um, I was a first round pick, not much long, not many years after that. So, um, so I guess I'll, I'll start there. But when I was playing in the minor leagues, uh, I mean, I was a high, a high prospect for the Padres. I was a number two prospect, I think, behind Chase Headley. And I flew through the, the minors really, really quickly. And I got to the big leagues pretty early for, a, I was drafted at 21. I think I was in the major leagues at 23. So I think it was under two years. It took me basically to get to the major leagues. Um, but it is, inc- I'll say this, it is incredibly hard. Um, even though it was a first round pick, like the players are so good. And I don't know if, pe- I don't think people realize I mean, I realized that I was a first round pick, but like I, I watched some of these players I played against and I'm like, these guys are incredible. Like, you know, I'm playing against, uh, I'm playing with Adrian Gonzalez. Like he was, he's one of the best hitters I've ever seen. Like I was nowhere close to as good as he was. I'm playing against like Josh Hamilton in the day. Like I'd never seen anyone like Josh Hamilton in my life. That guy was, you know, huge and he could run and he could throw and he could hit. And it was just, he was a freak show. And like, 
you know, and so I, I look at that and I think of like, it is such a hard league to not, it, it's almost impossible to get there. Then to be able to stay there and be successful is so, so difficult that I don't think most people realize how good those players are. And not only that, then it's, then it, you need to have some luck. You need like, I think I missed like 400 games in my career. Like I could not stay healthy to save my life. I had three wrist surgeries. I broke my hand. I hurt my knee. I pulled my hamstring bad. Like I got, I just started getting beat up a lot to the point where I was having difficulty practicing or doing anything. So like all this stuff happened and I didn't play as anywhere close to as long as I was hoping for, but that's, I mean, for me, like, that's the way it went. Like I, I tried as hard as I could. I work, I dedicated my life to baseball for a long time. And I don't know, I, I personally don't have anything to look back on and be like, I wish I had done this, you know, I wish I had worked harder or I feel like I worked as hard as I could and I didn't have the career I wanted to have. Um, but I enjoy coaching so much that like I, when I was done playing, I just like totally transitioned over to like, now I'm going to be the best coach I could possibly be. Um, and so people always say like, oh man, you wish you go back and do it again, everything. Like I would enjoy doing it, but I'm perfectly happy doing what I'm doing now. So uh, yeah, I have no complaints and, and, and all that stuff doesn't bother me when people say it. That, that was what I was going to ask next is that, you know, obviously, you know, Scherzer has the three Cy Youngs, but you could go and say, well, I have a YouTube channel that has over 200,000 <laughs> subscribers and I coach, you know, I, I yeah. have the most rewarding job in the world coaching, you know, all these kids in this awesome organization. So, yeah, I think that's awesome that you're, you're paying it forward and your life is still uh, committed to baseball. Um, how do you feel physically? I mean, do those, cause you, you mentioned the injuries just now, like, does do those stick with you is it like day by day basis like how are you feeling physically i know you're late 30s uh is, is yeah. everything going well on that front no being old thanks like i <laughs> thought uh 37 um it, i mean in some ways it doesn't feel very old but you know like i go out and and throw and then my arm hurts for like a week afterwards or um you know especially with my wrist so if i so I really can't hit a lot of people will be, you know, people want me to put my swing up on, on line more on YouTube and on social media. And, and I actually tried to do a little series called, uh, I think I, what I call road to 400. I think I said where I was trying to hit a ball 400 feet again, it lasted like, you know, three weeks because I hurt myself and couldn't do it anymore because, you know, my wrist hurts when I swing too much. And, you know, I, I hadn't worked out in forever and my back's killing me. And then I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I don't know why I'm spending the time when I, I just can't do this. So uh, the biggest thing is my wrist. So I, I, I had three wrist surgeries and I had a, I broke my hand. I have an arthritic wrist. So, you know, even when I fungal, when I hit ground balls for our players, if I do it a lot, my wrist hurts and uh, does get sore. That's the biggest problem. Everything else in my body, like uh, I'm, I still like, I'm in pretty decent shape. I can probably still run pretty fast. I can throw, I can still throw hard. It just, the next day it hurts. Um, but like, I don't feel that bad physically, I guess, um, for someone that doesn't do a whole lot of, of working out, but the wrist is definitely an issue. Like if, if people are always like, why don't you make a comeback? First of all, it's never going to happen. But if I even wanted to try to, I think my wrist would last about two, three weeks and, and that would be it. So unfortunately I had bad luck with, uh, with my, my wrist injury. Yeah. And, and I had in preparation for this, I had read, you know, oh, man, Antonelli injuries. And then the next tab I had open was like the road to 90 and you're throwing a bullpen. I was like, what is this guy doing? Just beating yeah. himself up and like and, and <laughs> you, you throw like three pitches, 77 still. OK, yeah. And so I was like, oh, OK, so he's trying to get to 90. So, I mean, I believe in you, man. I think you could do it. So you see that video, if you notice that road to 90 that I did, I haven't done another video since that bullpen because. I went from not throwing at all to then just thinking it was a good idea to come out and throw as hard as I could off the, off, off the mound. And uh, I can't remember what I hit that day. I don't know if I hit 80 or 79 or what it was, but I couldn't lift my arm for three weeks after that. Like I, I and I'm not kidding. I, my arm wouldn't go up over, you know, this height right here. And, uh, and then I just stopped doing it. I, I physically couldn't. Not a good idea to take uh, my last time playing was 2013. So what was that? Nine years ago, pretty much nine years. I took off from throwing a ball fast. Now I throw easy BP, but um, 
not a good idea to go from nine years of not throwing hard to trying to throw as hard as you can on a bullpen. I found out real quick that at 37, you can't, you can't do that. Yeah. Well, best of luck. I'm on the, I'm on the road to 90 train still. I know it's going to come back. I, I believe in you for sure. Maybe in the summertime again. Um, <laughs> and before we wrap up here um, now from real you to like kind of virtual you, you're playing MLB the show now on your YouTube channel. Uh, I guess, how is your character doing? Like, like fill us in on, on what virtual Matt Antonelli is doing there yeah. in the minor leagues. I know he's in the minor leagues. Tell us a little update about him. So I started that probably four years ago, maybe. Um, I was, uh, we were playing in a tournament in New Jersey at Diamond Nation. And one of our players was, you know, they were talking about playing the show. And um, they said, you should create your character and try to get to the big leagues again since, you know, another jab at me since your career didn't go as you, as you had hoped. It wasn't a very good career. I said, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I said, well, I, I mean, I don't know. My, my son had the game. So I said, I'll go home and try it. So I put out an episode. I, I, I filmed it. I, I screen recorded or whatever. And uh, I just said, hey, I'm going to try to make the big leagues again. Just kind of goofing around. And I threw it online. And uh, the next day, I woke up and had tens of thousands of views, like lots of views on a rant. And I, I thought it was silly. People on my team were like, oh, people will love to watch this. And I thought they were silly. Um, but I was like, holy, you know, crap, this is, there's a lot of people that are interested in this. So then it started. And then I, I enjoyed playing it for one, but then I was like, it's kind of cool because I can give my perspective as a real life player that worked his way through the minor leagues. And, um, and then this whole creator video game, this whole character video game Matt kind of was created where people have been following that now for like four years. And um, it's harder to do now because I'm more, bu I'm much busier now than I was four years ago, but I still every now and then like to, to, to play. It's, it's fun to play. My son enjoys playing the game. And, uh, and I did, I do think it was, it was a cool idea and people really, I mean, I have people that comment now that literally can, can tell me what happened in the first episode four years ago. And there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes that we've done since then. I think I started with the show, maybe, I, I don't know if it was uh, 18 or 19, but I mean, every year I put out a new, a new series and, uh, and we got to get rolling on, on 22 right now. Cause I'm slacking. I think I only got like eight or nine episodes up. Yeah, I saw he was still in the minor leagues. I was like, what's going yeah. on? It's September 20th. I mean, yeah, I gotta get going. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's awesome for sure. And uh, so I have one last thing I do this with. I tried it. I, I did it once with uh, Adam Rosales, former uh, MLB infielder who's known for the fast running around the bases. Oh, yeah. And I, I recently did it again with, um, oh God, who I, I, I recently did it again with someone else, but I'm going to show you a picture of one of your former minor league teammates and you have to tell me who it is. So this is oh, going to be, <laughs> this, I'm never going to get there. We were friends up until this point, you know, we got the whole Italian thing working, you know, risotto, Antonio. but now, now you're going to hate me for this. And I I'm fine with that. So let's, let's do it here. So I've I, seen 4,000, a million players. And again, throw a player up there. I have, I'll have no idea. Who it is. Okay. Sorry for the weird crop job on this one, but who is this? Oh, that's Theo. It's Peter Seafrom. There you go. Peter. Okay. Tell me about him. What do you remember about him? What made you pick Theo, by the way? Well, I, I noticed that he, so I tried to go with less obvious guys. Okay. And I noticed yep. that he had the most at bats one year that you were in Portland without making it to the, he was the only guy that didn't make it to the big leagues. And he had the most at bats out of all the guys that didn't make it. Yeah, I'll tell you this quick story about CO. So uh, that year was his best year of his career, I think, to, uh, 2008. And um, I, we, were, we were teammates in AAA, and I got called in to the manager's office, and I was told that I was getting called out to the big leagues. And you know, I was, like, super excited, obviously. And I remember um, one of the first things I thought was CO deserved to go up that year. Like, I, I actually felt that I was like, why am I going up? Like, I, I had a horrible year that year, actually. And I was like, I'm going up because I was, I was a first round pick. And I, I was hitting well, but honestly, like one of the first thoughts was he should be going up because he had a way better year than me. So uh, Sio is a great guy. Um, he, uh, he's funny. He's a very good hitter. He was undersized kid, smaller kid, but like could really just put the bat on the ball and hit the ball hard consistently. Didn't have like great 
what you would call major league tools, but could just play the game and, uh, and worked really, really hard. And I, I struggled big time that year in 2008. And uh, Theo is, uh, he's very straightforward. And so he would be like, you know, he would get into me and, and, and I, I guess yell at me for certain things. Like if I was struggling, you know, and he was doing it to pump me up, he'd be like, like, like so feeling sorry for yourself. But like, he would give me those kind of talks, like, you know, like when I was really down and uh, yeah, so he really helped me out, but he was a great guy. He was one of my good buddies back when, when I was playing. So I thought you were going to show somebody that I, uh, I mean, don't show anyone else, but you put up somebody that was easy for me to pick. Well, you got two more. You're, you're one for oh, three. Oh, no, you got two more, guys. <laughs> you're, you're one for three. Okay, don't uh, worry. You're going to make it worse now. I muted myself. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I can't hear you. Yeah, th- this next one, you got, this next one's going to be seamless. Okay, it's a, it's a right-handed pitcher, and this guy actually did make it to the big leagues. So hold oh, on one second. I have no idea. Who's that? Uh, oh, my God. Uh, Chris Gear. Yes, there you go. No, Josh. Josh. Josh, 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 Josh. I don't this know is why going well. What do you remember about Josh? Anything? Yeah, so we were actually together much shorter than me and CO. Like, um, Josh. Darn it. I don't know why I say Chris. Why would I say Chris? I'll give you half a point. Um, I, probably know, I probably know a bunch of Chris Gears. Uh, yeah, so Josh Gears. So Josh was um, – we played together much shorter. So that's probably why I, I screwed up his first name. It didn't come to me so quickly. Um, uh, me and Sia were probably a little bit, or we were closer friends. Um, uh, Josh was a great guy, uh, but we just weren't super close friends. We didn't play with each other as long as me and Sia did. So, um, but he was a right-handed pitcher. I remember like really good command, a good, like the ball had a lot of movement on it. Um, but I, I haven't talked to Josh since probably since the last time I played with him, which I can't remember what, when that was, yeah. but, ve- but very good guy. We just were never like super close friends. Okay. So I'll give you half a point for the, for getting the last name. That was pretty good. Well, I'm just going to uh, list last names now. Cause I, 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 I don't know why I was so quick to say Chris right there. Okay. I respect the decision. Okay. Here we go. I I'm think surprised I got, I'm, I'm surprised actually that I got that so quickly because like I've had a million teammates and it weren't, mm-hmm. it wasn't like we were like best friends or anything. All right, good. Okay, here we go. Last one. Final one. I think you know this guy pretty well. Who's this? Jeez. Uh, is that Brett Dowdy? That is Brett Dowdy. That's kind of a recent picture of Brett Dowdy, so I might have messed with your head there a little bit. Yeah, that, I, well, I, I, exactly. I mean, um, so the last time I saw Brett was – I don't remember the last time I saw him. It was a long time ago. But, but he's your double I mean, play partner, him, right? What's that? He was your double play partner, right? In the minor leagues. He was, I saw the twins and all that stuff. And I was like, I had to give it a second look there, but yeah, so we were together in triple a. Um, I don't know if we were together at any other levels, but uh, mostly triple a uh, middle, middle infield guy, good fielder. Actually, I think 2000, I don't remember if it was 2008 or 2009. He had a really, really, really good year as well. Kind of like a career year for him. I think, um, always a fast guy, like really good athlete. Um, but he, he put up pretty good offensive numbers. It was either eight or nine. You'd have to look it up and see, but, um, yeah, good, good guy. Um, I think I might've told a a couple of YouTube stories about him. Uh, so we, we were, we were buddies. We weren't together for like a long time. We were only teammates for a pretty short amount of time, but, um, was another, was one of my good, you know, one of my friends and, and we were middle, middle, uh, or double play partners, like you said. So I did a lot of infield work with them. So I nailed it with CO. That, that was my that was my favorite one because that was your favorite one. So we'll go with that. But I'll give you a good two and a half out of three. That was pretty good. Not a lot of people. I mean, uh, Adam Rosales really struggled with it. Um, and, and the last person I had on, I don't know why. I'm, oh, I had Manny Parra, who used to pitch left-handed pitcher. Um, yeah, was a reliever, and he got he got them all th- all three of them. So, and again, I did mostly guys that didn't make it to the big leagues and he still nailed it, but so it's not, it's not unnatural for you to struggle. So, <laughs> yeah, if you, if you, um, it, it's funny now, now I'm starting to think about like all my teams. So like I can, um, I can remember pretty much like if we go year for year, I can remember pretty much position players 
especially. No, notice they are the only one that I screwed up when I said Chris instead of Josh was the pitcher. Um, like positionally, and it, it, baseball isn't always like this. Like Way LeBlanc is one of my best friends when I played. He was probably my best friend, and he was a pitcher. Typically, position players hang out with position players a lot, and the pitchers are with the pitchers a lot. And so, like, if I can go through all of my, my position player, like, years and almost, like, name the lineup for you. At least I remember everybody. Now, I might forget a kid's first name or something like that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think I, I think I, I do pretty well with, with most players, positionally, at least. If you threw up pitchers again, though, like, if you threw up a <laughs> random pitcher for when I was with the Nationals, like, one year – I'd have, I'd probably have no idea. Yeah. I wasn't going to be mean and like, like give you any of your Columbus teammates or anything like that. I mean, oh, I'd have no clue. You, you could, <laughs> I, 80% of those guys, I was in Columbus for like eight and a half minutes. So like I was, I was released within how long was I there? I was there for a month and, uh, and I barely, I mean, I barely played. I could probably name like three or four guys from that team. Yeah. There you go. Anyways, uh, Matt, this was awesome, and uh, I really appreciate the time. We went a little over than the time that I said, so I appreciate you sticking around. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on, man. You're good. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. And, again, you guys could all find his uh, content on YouTube at Antonelli Baseball. Go check him out. Uh, he's got a great Instagram presence, too. Uh, he mentioned that he's seen millions of swings, and uh, there's probably thousands of swings on his Instagram page, so – Go check that out. Uh, a lot of great instructional clip on his YouTube clips on his uh, YouTube channel. A lot of good, uh, you know, if you have a question about Major League Baseball and what players do, he usually answers them. You know, I mentioned the Antonelli type of videos. He's the only one that comes out with some of them. So so go check him out. Uh, also, the road to the show stuff as well. Um, and again, this podcast, you can catch us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcasts and on YouTube as well. So thank you guys for listening. And have a great day.